Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to start. Good, me good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Professor Uzi Rabi. I am the director of the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Tel Aviv University. Uh, I would like to express my uh, pleasure and gratitude for you all coming to Tel Aviv University and this forum. Uh, as always, the Gandal Symposium is dedicated to the analysis of what we call the current affairs of the Middle East. We can say definitely that this year has been a tumultuous one. What we have in the region is a series of upheavals all over the Arab fold. We always say we don't know what we're going to end up with, but we are not going back to square one. This is the 21st century. There are some themes and I would say tools that should be used from now on, different from those who, which were used by us in the 20th century. I'll just, uh, I would like to share with you some of the thoughts my colleagues and me do have here in Tel Aviv University while trying to update our research and teaching agenda in front of this ever-changing region. And then I'll introduce our distinguished guests and we'll have, I guess, a uh, uh, fascinating discussion about what's going on in the Middle East. What we can say about the current situation in the Middle East is that we are in the midst of a very convoluted process. One cannot I would say foster the future vision of the region. We don't know where we're going to end up with, as I said before. But since we are in the middle of 2012, I think it's high time for us to glean some insights and tools with which to better analyze the region. We do say some things, and we are being equipped with some new insights with regard to what we call the political culture or the political climate, barriers of fear collapsed in the region. We do see that day by day in Syria, in Hamas, in Hama, people do ask time and again about the politics of survival of Bashar al-Assad. I think that the most important thing is the people in Syria who keep going on and on, challenging the regime. And we know that this is just the beginning of a real upheaval and change here. And we do say that the political formula of the region is going to be changed because people are going through kind of psychological revolution with barrier of fears being collapsed. Who is going to take the lead? That's another thing we cannot ignore while looking at what's going on in Tunisia, in Egypt, and so forth. It seems that Islamists are coming to the fore, taking the lead. This by itself, at least when it comes to the short run, is very imperative. Because we know this is a different discourse, a different vision. And we have to make sure, while trying to map the new forces in Egypt or Tunisia, to better understand what Salafis are, what do they have in mind, Muslim brothers and others. We won't have the one and only anymore. In the 20th century, we used to say, Al-Assad family is Syria. We even depicted that as the Kardakha gang. Or uh, uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Mubarak, Egypt, Gaddafi, Libya. It was pretty easy for us to analyze the then region 
because we were focusing on this wide gallery of one-man show, so to speak. We won't have that anymore. And even the Americans, the West superpowers, will have to find out a way by which to better understand the new rhythm in Tunisia, in Egypt, Yemen, Libya, Syria, etc. I think that we are witnessing kind of a real change here. And unfortunately, while looking at states like Libya and Yemen, one could jump to the conclusion that once we are toppling the dictator or the dictator is being toppled, in such state with a very convoluted or complex socio-demographic composition, more often than not, it ends up with a bloody civil war. This is the case in Yemen. This is the case in Libya. This is what we're going to have in Syria. And this is something that we have to bear in mind. In most cases, in such states, when dictators are being toppled, what we're going to see is a view of what we call, or it being depicted by the scholarly literature, failed state, which means kind of a regime that cannot control or exert full influence over all the region. And what we have in Yemen, what we have in Libya, is lacunas or latifundias being controlled by radical forces like Al-Qaeda and others. We do hope that in the long run, history will balance the different forces and we get some sort of stability here. But basically, while looking at the short run, I think it is becoming uh, kind of a very uh, uh, complex uh, situation. And we can go on and on talking about the changing region or the ever-changing region. And uh, what I try to say is that uh, we do have in mind different themes and thoughts. Let me give you just one final, one, uh, final uh, let us say, theme with which to better understand the region. There is a new geopolitical setting in the Middle East, that's for sure. In the 20th century, we talked about the Middle East while focusing on the Arab fold. It went without saying. Cairo, Baghdad, Damascus were centers of gravity. This is where actually things happened. And while trying to dictate or to follow the rhythm of the Middle East, one more often than not, followed closely the rhythm of Cairo and the Arab fold. What we have now in the Middle East, and this is something that we have been witnessing in the recent decades, non-Arab players, Turkey and Iran, are coming to the fore, two historical giants. Each of them is vying for hegemony in the region. And at the expense of the Arab states, they are trying to secure kind of a predominant or a dominant position for themselves in the region. So there is a change in the guard, of the guard here. We have to be aware of that. And it has to do with what we call the geopolitical setting. I would say just one final observation, or come up with just one final observation, which makes for me uh, or serves as kind of an indication of how things changed here. If you look at this triangle, Egypt, Turkey, and Iran, we have always had the opportunity to say that at least one out of three, or two out of three, are kind of pro-Western or even friendly to Israel. We have said that about Iran's Shah, about Turkey before Erdogan, and about Egypt's Mubarak. I think that we are, for the first time, with kind of an unprecedented situation where all these three could be defined, albeit in a different level, I mean, there's, uh, but could be defined as anti-Western 
I would say even anti-Israeli, which makes one think about the geopolitical setting. And we do hope that, as I said before, in the long run, those youth who initiated the revolutions will come to the fore and will balance what we call the new different ball game we have in the Arab fold in the Middle East. But in the midst of this tense and uh, transitional period, we could focus on a variety of states, you know, Syria, Tunisia, Libya. But today we have chosen to center our discussion on two countries. One would say two giants, Egypt and Iran, Iran and Egypt. I think that the events in these countries are of great importance in the shaping of what we call the emerging regional order. At this point in time, the impact of two upcoming events, and this is a most timely discussion, June 2012. The impact of two upcoming events, the first of which is the second round of the presidential elections in Egypt on June 16th and 17th this month, and immediately after that, 18th and 19th, the next round of nuclear talks between world powers and Iran in Moscow. I think that the results of these meetings, election runoff, would be of great importance to the future of the region. Both Egypt and Iran, as I said before, I mean, historically speaking, been influential regional actors whose policies and positions were pretty important for all means and purposes in the Middle East. This is also true of today, when in Egypt we are trying to get kind of an idea of what kind of Egypt we're going to have. We have two candidates. Morsi, who represents the Muslim Brothers, Shafiq, a remnant of the Ansio regime. And we'll wait and see what Egypt is going to come up with. The other leg of our discussion, one would say the most important one, is Iran with a nuclear file getting closer to Moscow in something or kind of a meeting which seems to be of a crucial importance And we uh, try to address these two issues. With two distinguished guests we have here. We will start with Iran. And the former head of the Mossad, Mr. Meir Dagan, is with us to discuss the issue. Mr. May Dagan was the head of the Mossad in the years 2002-2010. Since leaving the Mossad, Dagan's voice has also made an important contribution to the public discourse of, uh, in Israel by bringing the debate about the military operation against Iran into the public sphere where it can be discussed, evaluated, and assessed by the public. Uh, Mr. May Dagan, by virtue of his position and accomplishments, has legitimized alternatives to the narrative being presented by the current Israeli government about what can be done about Iran. We are very honored to have with us Mr. Dagan today. And will you uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Mayor Dagan? <laughs> 